Hello and welcome to the all new, all different, number one comics podcast, episode number 20. That's right kids, that's right Bob, anniversary episode. We've done this 20 times Bob. Wow. Can you believe that? No. Yeah, that's that's pretty insane. 20 straight weeks, we haven't skipped a beat yet, uh, pretty, pretty cool. Anyways, in this here podcast... Each and every week, we take a look at a brand new first issue comic book, break down the story and art, give it a review, and tell you if we think that you should move on to issue number two. We also talk a little bit of comic book and related news, as well as what's new at comic book shops this and next week. This week, Bob, we'll be covering the all-new number one, From DC Comics, City Boy, written by Greg Pak and illustrated by Minkyu Young. I'm I'm so happy you said the name. Nothing makes me happier. (laughs) Now I can at least try to replicate what you said whenever I (laughs) talk about the creators of this book. Good luck. Yeah, well, good luck to me. (laughs) We're going to take a very, very brief break, and we'll be back in just a moment. And we are back with episode number 20 of the all new, all different number one comics podcast. I made a small mistake there, actually a large mistake in our intro. I didn't announce us as hosts of this show. I'm Dan (laughs) and sitting across from me is Bob. Say hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. All right, good. I'm glad we got that in there. I wasn't going to say anything. (laughs) I mean, I referenced your name a few times, so I think maybe that that does something, but I don't know. It's, it's still not proper. So, but everybody likes to hear my greeting. Absolutely. And we're nothing if not proper. So here we are. Yes. (laughs) Thank God for that. Bob, let's talk some comic book news. There's comic book news? There's a little bit of comic book news. There's actually a a paper comic book news if you want to hear some. Um, We're talking image comics, and we're talking the latest in the leaving of Diamond Distribution. Image has packed up, and they have an exclusive deal with Lunar, the same company that distributes DC's comics. Oh. Yes. Did they specify a reason? No, of course they put out like a press notice, uh, uh, Todd McFarlane, um, and I think maybe it was Eric Larson kind of put together this joint thing that said, uh, we love um, Diamond and we wish them nothing but the best and they've been great and they've gotten all of our, you know, they they launched us and got all of our books into shops for all these years and and decades and everything and they're very grateful for that, but but it's time to be moving on to other things. I'm glad somebody loves Diamond. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I look. I can't remember how it started. It started with with DC leaving uh, Diamond mm-hmm. and going to Lunar, and then right. shortly after that, Marvel followed with an exclusive deal with Penguin Random House. Mm-hmm. And while a lot of people say that the stuff from Penguin comes in in really bad shape and and all of this, they're not well protected. They say the complete opposite about Lunar, that they really protect the books. They come in really nice and, and never have any damage or anything like that. I actually, for a while, was was uh, ordering in bulk from, um, from Penguin Random House. Also, I mean, of course, not as much as a traditional comic book shop, right. but... But, like, you, but enough to figure out yeah. what's what. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Did and you have any issues? It, well, that's what I was going to say. I never had an issue. Never had an issue with with any issue. <laughs> all, the, all the books were fine. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Everything came out good, but I can understand. Um, sometimes we're talking high incentives and stuff like that. One right. in one in one hundreds, right. one in two hundreds, whatever. And you want those things taken care right. of because they expect books. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. This next week we've got ASM twenty six coming out. There's a, I think it's a, it's either a one in two hundred or it might be a one in five hundred. But it's a very high incentive, and and to know that Penguin is just going to send that out non-bagged and boarded, just in a pile with the rest of the books with not really mm-hmm. any protection, just kind of in like a really tight box with bubble wrap around the box, or not bubble wrap, sorry, peanuts, and then put in another box, and that's that's it. So there's not really any level of protection there, and I hear that Lunar is, is just completely different than that, that they really protect everything 
which is good, especially whenever you have, I don't know, 25,000 different Batman incentives coming out that people want to pay money for for some reason. So. Right, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, it, we've seen firsthand and anybody who's, you know, got a uh, closer relationship with their uh, comic book shop mm-hmm. owner, you know, has heard and seen horror stories yeah. on oh, yeah. comics. I yeah, mean, and you see the damages. You, right. Yeah. I mean, how many? Uh, we don't know how many times he's had to rip up comics yep. and send the cover and uh-huh. say, "Hey, it was, you know, sent damaged." So. Yeah, and and a lot of times you're thinking, yeah, you might get credit for that. They might, you know, resend it out or whatever uh, a week or two later. But at least comic book speculation is is so time sensitive. A lot of times. Right. <laughs> What somebody will pay two hundred dollars for in the shop that week, they won't even come close to paying half of that next week. You know, they, it's not, it's not worth it anymore. Remember that Robin King issue? <laughs> All too well. I think I had about four of those incentives. Um, but and they, yeah. they, they were originally what you could get two hundred to two hundred a piece for them, easy. Oh yeah, easy. Now what fifty bucks? If that, I think I when I was doing my live shows, I gave away a nine point eight slab, Ooh. gave it away. Ooh. Yeah, it like no big deal, you know. It's just, and that was within the span of what a week, week yeah, and a half. Oh yeah, something like that. It, it just didn't retain any value. Yeah, no value there. And of course, what do you hear about Robin King now? So, I mean, this isn't exactly the same thing, but just to look at the um, the recent comic World Tree. Yep. Look mm-hmm. at the recall cover. Oh, I mean, yeah. if you didn't jump on that right away yep. and put those issues on eBay or Facebook or, you know, wherever you sell, yep. then by the time the regular, you know, cover comes around, if you have 50 covers of the recall variant, then they aren't going to be worth anything. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, this happens all the time. Look, we just a couple of weeks ago had that... Um, you know, being a, uh, I don't know, a wholesaler for uh, Penguin Random House, I do get some of the nice benefits from that. Like I got the Spider-Man 2, the the game, you know, free free book. Mm-hmm. I, got, I think 25 copies were sent to me. They were all very nice and clean, very happy about that. But we saw that kind of rise to, to like an almost $30 mark, and now it's back down, you know. I mean, still, shit, if you can get, you can still get, you can get 10, 10 to 12 bucks, yeah, bucks for, for a free book, that's awesome. Right, but, right. but, of course, it didn't hold that level of value. No. There's so many out there. You know, everybody with a, with a Penguin Random House account got, got 25 copies. So there's a good amount out there. Uh, I think maybe a lot of people gave them away for free comic book day, which is mm-hmm. cool. But, um, but, yeah, anyways, very, very cool. So, so I don't know. I don't even know what to ask because what does that mean to us that now Lunar will be distributing Image Comics and and Diamond won't have that exclusive deal anymore? I don't think it means much to us. It shouldn't matter either way. We're still going to get our Image books. I, I never see any Lunar stuff getting delayed or anything like that, so that's a good sign. No, it, it's, it's usually always Diamond that gets delayed. Yep, so exactly. This may actually, especially for comic shop owners, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This will be a good thing. Yeah, this will be good. Now, the only exclusive rights that Diamond has now are going to be those smaller publishers. The largest one being Boom Studios now. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, before that, the largest was Image. So now we've got Boom. We've got all of those smaller uh, independent comic book companies, comic book publishers with exclusive rights. So how long do you give it? How long do you think until IDW, till Boom Studios, till some of those switch over to, to somewhere else. I actually don't think it'll be that long. Cause yeah. <laughs> I mean, image, uh-huh. once image left, I mean, they see, okay, image, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's probably the third biggest, you know, yep. comic mm-hmm. book publisher. Now they, you know, left, maybe we should follow suit. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it said something to have DC and Marvel both leave. But those are the big two. I mean, right. they don't really sit in the same, I don't know, wheelhouse that independent publishers do. No. And now the largest independent publisher is left and, and gone to somewhere else. 
I agree with you. I think that that opens the door, that opens the floodgates, really, and everyone's going to start looking for other deals. And, I, I mean, good for them because, look, for all this time, Diamond's had that monopoly, and it's yep. good that they don't yep. anymore, in my opinion. Exactly. Yeah, so... A, a little bit of actual comic book news is always fun sometimes. The next thing I wanted to bring up is, Bob, we got an announcement. Uh, Micronauts coming back to Marvel. Hey. Rom is back over at Marvel. We're getting two Omnibuys, Omnibuses. I don't know how you pluralize Omnibus. but uh, I'll stick with Omnibus. Yeah, I like that. Maybe sounds, you made up a new word. Uh, sure, why not? It sounds good, though. But yeah, starting next year for Marvel new microverse the original marvel years omnibus collections will reprint the entire comic run of micronauts for the first time ever plus a brand new facsimile edition of micronauts one on sale in september and like i said this comes just after announcing the ram oh, sorry rom omnibus i don't know what ram <laughs> is, but <laughs> I, well, you uh, are sitting in front of a computer sure sure we'll we'll blame that <laughs> But yeah, that's I don't know what you have thoughts. There's <laughs> not much because yeah. I'm not familiar with the characters. Um, I mean, Rom. I mm -hmm. mean, I know he's a space knight. Yeah, I was about to say he's, <laughs> he's the space knight. I mean, and he was rumored for a few years to show up in the Guardians. The Guardians, movies. yeah, I remember. Yep. He was, mm -hmm. and. Weirdly enough, the only thing I know about Micronauts is, and this comes from um, the uh, Netflix episode um, of The Toys That Made Us. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love that show. On, um, show. actually, G.I. Joe. Oh, okay. And actually, um, well, no, I'm sorry, Transformers. Mm -hmm. no, that would make more sense, yeah. And actually, if it, if it wasn't for G.I. Joe... We would have no Micronauts, mm -hmm. and we would not have no Transformers. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, crazy to think about something as big as Transformers not existing because of something like G.I. Joe. That's that's pretty crazy. But yeah, well, I, I guess mean, G.I. Joe just, I mean, who knows? Eventually, we may have gotten Transformers. I don't know. But, you know, just from, you know, the surplus of G.I. Joe toys that uh, the Japanese got, I mean, that you know, inspired, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of yep. eventually what would become Transformers, which I don't know if I'd like to live in a world without Transformers. <laughs> not a world for Bob. No, not my world. Yeah. Uh, no, super cool. Look, the only thing I really know about Micronauts is there was a Micronauts Man-Thing crossover at one point, so I did read those issues, but just... You know, just silly fun, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, I, I really know next to nothing about Micronauts. Yeah, I agree. Uh, not not much there. But but look, cool. It, it is It does kind of set like a... I, I can't think of the word, but there's something going on at Marvel lately, you know? They're picking up these licenses. They've got Predator. They've got Aliens. They've got Planet of the Apes. Are they, like, really looking to get back into, like, the franchise like licensee like thing like it's really starting to look like it they're really kind of pumping out some stuff over there and and really sticking with these projects so well and i'm wondering and i'll ask you about it they're saying you know it's going to be omnibuy to mm -hmm. it for lack of yes. a better term and facsimiles of number one mm -hmm. how long do you think they'll start Till they start making original comics. Oh God! It. I mean, that was my first thought. Was they they right. put out the only reason to put out the omnibus and to put out a facsimile is because it's something's coming. Interest. Yeah, it, it's got to be coming directly after that. I I'd be very surprised if there wasn't already a script out there being. I don't know. Getting an artist signed on now or so. I mean, well, not sorry, not now because this is coming. This omnibus is. In fact, similarly, are coming out in September. So, yeah, I'm sure there's probably, like, there's got to be a couple of issues in the can already, I would imagine. Well, and another reason why Marvel might finally be, you know, acquiring, reacquiring, mm -hmm. should I say, these uh, franchises is there was talk a few years ago about that Hasbro 
universe because yep. of mm-hmm. course you know the connected universes are the big things nowadays yeah. because of the mcu mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but um rom and the micronauts were talked about for that universe you know that brings up another interesting question and i'm gonna segue here because just because you said it like okay. i kind of want to know now this is okay. this is on the spot there's not anything here in my notes for it right is there a world now uh, that we can exist in where studios are not pushing to make these expanded like shared universes like does that exist because look so many people have tried it they wanted to do the universal dark universe they wanted to do of course dc and that's turned into the biggest cluster that i've ever seen in my life but and those aren't a lot of examples but all you hear about is how everybody wants to take that page out of the Marvel book and have an expanded shared universe with movies that connect with one another. That's all anybody wants. That's all anybody's looking for. Like, do you think that we're seeing the heights on that and it's going to implode and then we're just going to start seeing these standalone movies again? Do you think they're always going to be chasing this? I think for right now, the franchise movie is here to stay. Yeah. But as You've seen with the Marvel movies, mm-hmm. there might be something to this franchise fatigue. Yeah, so definitely. Until, you know, that really kicks in, the franchises are going to be here to stay. Because everybody wants to... Everybody wants to imitate... I mean, look, look at how much money... Yeah. <laughs> the MCU as a collective has made. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A lot. And you're telling me that other companies, studios, don't want to try to imitate even a fraction of that? I find it so odd that the model is out there for them. Mm-hmm. And no one can, can kind of do that just with their own thing. I mean, that... the, the Universal Monster thing like should have worked. It's weird that they wanted to start <laughs> the way that they did. Uh, with that Tom Cruise well, mummy movie. But... Well, actually, actually, that wasn't going to be the start. Oh, okay. The start was going to be Dracula Untold. Okay, well, that makes more sense, I guess. And that movie bombed even worse than yeah. the Tom Cruise mummy movie. Yeah. I still haven't seen that Tom Cruise and mummy movie. then they were going to incorporate... Um, what, what, what was it? Um... That Guillermo del Toro, um, oh the the Shape one, of Water, yes, yes, with Shape, the, with yeah, the creature that, of the Black Lagoon that looking was guy, basically yeah. going to be their creature of the Black Lagoon. Okay, Lagoon. that just, was a, that was a very interesting movie. Just because <laughs> you know that movie did so well, uh-huh, uh-huh. they were going to incorporate. I mean, I don't know if Guillermo del Toro would have been on board with it. Sure, sure, but just because you know it did so well, it's mm-hmm. like. Oh, let's let's have this. Let's incorporate this movie. Yep. And then the mummy came along and basically killed anything, <laughs> any sort of franchise they wanted to do. Well, that was a widely hated movie. Um, so look, I'm gonna. <laughs> I've got a natural way to segue into this next little bit of news because we were talking about Tom Cruise. This has a little bit to do with Tom Cruise. I don't know. This is. Very, very odd. Scientology to me. is still bad, kids. Are you sure? I mean, I, I that's what I was gonna go into. If you guys want to learn more about the Church of Scientology, please uh, <laughs> get at me at Twitter. Um, Give I'm, away all your money to Dan and Bob. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, no, I want to talk just for a second. We'll make it quick, but I want to talk about this Flash movie again because it keeps coming up. There's early reviews now. There's, of course screenings from uh i don't know other celebrities and writers and stuff like that who have seen it reviews are out there whatever there was a fake i saw a really cool fake alan moore one that said like the flash movie is the best thing i've ever seen and all this yeah, stuff did, I, did you I, see I, that, that was, I've, I've seen that yeah. so i think i know where you're going yeah of, of course that was fake but um but everyone seems to be saying how mm-hmm. good this is mm-hmm. in a way that i'm sorry i'm sorry to say this but it seems completely fabricated it seems it like is. It seems unrealistic that people like Stephen King, Tom Cruise would be coming out and saying, this is the best movie ever made. You need to come see this. Why? Why? It's funny that you mentioned Stephen King because Mm -hmm. I did read something about this. And this is almost exactly what happens 
when there's a new novel that's out, yep. you flip to the back of the book uh -huh. or the back cover and you see reviews yep. by different people yep. and they're all glowing reviews. They're never negative. Yeah, of course not. Of course. Uh, it's, I don't know, man. It's, it's so interesting because when has this ever happened with anything? You ever... that's, a, that's a very that's a very good question. I actually don't remember any movie where you know a list actors and writers mm -hmm. are coming out and saying this is the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, it makes you wonder why. Like, did did they really sit down in the theater and have right. such a great time that they were like, oh my god, I've never seen anything this good, and I have to get online and talk about it? Or was there some other incentive? And and I don't know or or what but i i do know that it seems odd it seems very very odd and it doesn't help me change my opinion about the movie um i think that i'm gonna have a problem either way supporting ezra miller we've already talked about that i i find it very look a lot of people worked on the movie i know that he's just one bad apple in that whole bunch but i'm gonna have a hard time supporting you know that. in you know my thing and this is going to be a hot take for yep. me. This is going to be a very hot take. But, um, and I hate comparing these two because it's kind of like apples <laughs> and oranges. Yep. But, I mean, it's the same negative, you know, press. Something happened. So, you know, Ezra Miller is being talked about as, you know, possibly going forward with the, with the Flash character and mm -hmm. all that. Yep. And then, you know, on the flip side, you have Jonathan Majors. Exactly. Who exactly. Did what he did, and do I condone what Jonathan Majors no, did? No, hell no. No, I yeah. never of condone putting your hands on anybody. Nope. I never, I never condone that. But we're talking about Ezra Miller, mm -hmm. who's you know we've heard from multiple people that he's basically groomed people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's basically brainwashed people. Yep. I mean, so it, it's it's kind of like. Why why does Jonathan Major seem to, you know, basically get all this, sh you know, crap against him? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ezra Miller is yeah, he, he I know he's I know he's gotten help. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I mean, he still did what he did. I agree. It's like why is he kind of uncancelable <laughs> and and somebody like Jonathan Majors, you know, is not like he's losing right. all of this. I he's probably he's probably gonna yeah, lose. He's, he's role probably done. Yeah, yes. he's, he's probably done. Right. And and why is why is Ezra Miller not as the Flash? And and I think that uh, look, you and I aren't going to be able to answer that question. I don't know, but but I can tell you that all of this seems like manufactured and forced to me. It seems very very odd. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. I hate to say it because it makes me sound like I hate DC and I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. I, I want them to do good and everything. But it just it goes back to every single time DC does anything. A new movie comes out. They switch over something with their universe. They Now it's headed by James Gunn. Before it was this, blah, blah, blah. Every single time it's like, no, you don't understand. This changes everything. And now... DC is on track, and that's what I hear every single time. Was it Jeff Johns supposed to change everything? Everything. I mean, every single time it changes, and it's like, now we've got it all figured out, and now we know what we're doing, and now, and I just, I'm I'm not going to buy it again. Like, I don't care. I I hope that they do. I really hope that they do. I, I wish nothing but success for them. We've talked at length about how we want to see mm -hmm. a good Superman movie. We want to see some of these secondary characters. I hope all of this stuff turns out really good. I hope in 10 years from now, we're watching a cool like Superman pal, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen movie. <laughs> and it's good. And, and all of that stuff. I'd love to see house of secrets. I there, there's all kind of stuff that they could do at DC that would really impress me. to be very excited to see, but I'm not going to buy it. This is not doing anything for me. And I'm sorry to say this, but I've watched every trailer that's come out for Flash, and it it doesn't look good to me. It just doesn't look good. They're de they're I mean they're definitely hyping the fact that Michael Keaton is in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Which which has me scared because of the fact that it 
kind of like this is a flash movie yeah <laughs> and you're hyping you know ben affleck batman yep. michael keaton batman mm -hmm. uh you know kara zor-el supergirl yeah absolutely it it's almost like in the trailers this has very little to do with flash and and so much to do with these other characters are they trying to make like an avengers level movie like in this one take like what without again that's what happened before that's what you know batman v superman kind of thing was that's that's what the problem was it's like let's shoehorn it all in right here so we don't have to do the work behind it right that's that's what didn't work before and it almost makes me feel like are is, are they trying to make that work now like what is this about I really don't know. I, I don't have any answers. I just have thoughts. I sound like a DC hater. I know that this is a DC episode. <laughs> We're doing a DC comic. Look, I'm just, I know I sound very negative on DC. I am not. I like DC a lot. I like a lot of the characters over We're at DC. comic book fans. Yes. I'm not a huge Batman fan, but we all already know that. I don't like the Joker. Other than that, I'm fine with everything over at DC, and I want them to do good, and I really really hope that they do but i think that i i don't know this it just seems so odd i i, I just think they started about 10 years too late yeah absolutely i mean marvel did marvel did what a 10-year build-up yep mm -hmm. i mean they got it right unfortunately you know dc tried to go try to you know cut that in half yep and it didn't work and and like I was saying, they it's like they don't want to put the work in. They don't want to invest the time and no. and money and energy to to building these separate movies. Look, the MCU worked because Iron Man came out. It was people liked it, you know. Then they were like, we can do a Thor movie. We can do this, you know. We can do these different things, and and they did. And it wasn't about the team at all until the Avengers movie came out. And again, if Iron Man had not been a success, yes. there would be no MCU. No, absolutely. We'd have like an Iron Man movie or two and then whatever. It'd be like those Fantastic Four movies that sucked, you know? Uh, those did the same thing, you know? They tried to kind of put this thing out, force it on us, and, and it just it didn't work. It doesn't work. Marvel's made a lot of mistakes too. And not that that's Marvel Studios, but you understand, like... Uh, Marvel properties have made lots of mistakes too. It just so happens that Kevin Feige is just really good at what he does. And of course, not just him. There's a, whole, a huge yeah, yeah. team behind it all of that. It takes an army. Yeah, absolutely. But but it just it just happened to work. Now, with that being said, there's a lot of moving pieces in there to make that work. There is. There is. Nobody was just saying, let's make an Avengers movie straight off the bat without anybody caring about these characters. And then we can go from there. <laughs> they didn't do that. And I'm sorry. That's what this flash movie looks like. Yeah. And my hope, my whole thing is the trailers just don't seem to focus on the flash and it's a flash movie. Yeah, I, I agree. It doesn't seem to focus on the flash. <laughs> I, I love Michael Keaton. We all love Michael Keaton as Batman. He was fun. I like Ben Affleck as Batman. I think Ben Affleck's fine. Yeah. Uh, he was he was a good Batman. Yeah. But I just, I don't know, man. I, I don't see it. And I don't understand what the purpose is. Maybe something big will happen. Maybe it will be uh, a big deal once, once we see that in there. And some huge secrets will be revealed and all of this stuff. And we'll feel differently about it. But right now it seems very odd. So... That's that's kind of all I want to say about that. I don't want to sit here and, and drag it down too much with talking negatively of, of The Flash or, or anything like that. But I will say... I will say <laughs> that... Say it already! Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just... Man, it's 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 a hard subject well, to talk I mean, about, we'll I guess. We'll see, what is it? Uh, second week of June? Yes. So we'll see. We'll see if it's really the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, we really will. And I, I think the only other thing I wanted to add to the end of that was, I think I could see Tom Cruise. I think I could see some other people, actors and stuff like that, coming out in support of something 
for whatever reason that that that, that has. I mean, it, it's yeah, it's it's a movie. It's what they do. Sure, Stephen King. I don't get I man. Like he seems so straight to me. Like it seems like you know he would not put his name on something unless there was a a legitimate reason, not not a financial incentive, nothing. Like he seems very very weird about that kind of thing to me. Not that I know the guy, but. <laughs> uh, I just it, it it seems so odd. So so I don't know. Maybe he does love it. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's great. I hope so. Anyways, we will we'll find out soon, and I guess we'll report back uh, after Bob has seen it. So because <laughs> I'm not going to the theater for that. But <clears throat> we are going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to talk about some new books that came out in comic book shops this week. And we are back with the all new, all different number one comics podcast episode number twenty. Let's talk about some new books that dropped in comic book shops this very week from Image Comics, the newest lunar distributed comic book <laughs> publisher. We had a super massive one shot. Really, really excited about that. If you're into Radiant Black, Radiant Pink, Radiant Red, or, no, sorry, Inferno Red, uh, all, all of those cool, cool books over there, the massive verse. We get a big one shot that just focuses on one story. Excited about that. It has huge ramifications from what I hear, but I have not read it just yet. Over from DC Comics, we had Green Arrow number two with Bob's favorite new character, Troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're excited about that one. I, I feel like that character is going to be like the Joker. Because the Joker is a troublemaker. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of troublemakers over there <laughs> in DC just causing trouble. We also had Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue number three. Yes. And the reason I bring this one up was, for one, the book is cool. But for two, they keep doing these awesome gimmick covers. And I, mm. I love gimmick covers. But the it, it's just the robot man. And it's like the you know metal brushed cover and everything. It's so cool. I really like that cover a lot. So we got that. From Marvel Comics, we have the brand new number one, Daredevil and Echo number one. I guess Marvel didn't think Echo could pull her own book, but she can pull her own show. So mm. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We had a Fury one shot. So Fury number one had some cool covers for that. Also had Extreme Venomverse number two, a book that Bob and I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Got wait, wait, say that title again. Extreme Venomverse two. There you go. All right, sorry, sorry. We got uh, Venom 1602 in there and just all kind of stuff. So excited about that one. We also got an Iron Man 1 facsimile. So if you can't afford an <laughs> Iron Man 1. Uh, Let's face it, that's starting to be a lot of people. Yeah, a lot. I agree. Then this is your next best choice. And we also got a Storm number 1. I'm really, really excited to read. Love that yes, character. I know you'll be picking that. I know you did pick that. Oh, yeah. I think I picked up about three covers of <laughs> it too, but you know me. I can't help myself sometimes. Mm. From Scout Comics, we got Drexler number one. From Udon, we got Street Fighter six number one. And Bob, I'm glad that we sp spun the wheel last week and we didn't land on Street Fighter versus TMNT because it actually was not out this week. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know when it actually comes out, but it wasn't this week, so we we dodged a bullet the, there. Who was the publisher on that? I'm not too. It was probably IDW, I would guess. They hold the license to TMNT. I'm sure that it was IDW, but... Distributed by Diamond. Yeah. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. Could be. We also got from Opus Comics, Within Temptation, number one. Again, I talked about this on the last episode. I think this is their first book that does not focus on something music related. So could be very, very interesting there. That's, a, that's the first time I've heard from that imprint. Oh, well, they do all kind of stuff. They do a book for like Disturbed, for Halloween. I think Iron Maiden, uh, lots of uh, Evanescence. Uh-huh. Yeah. Band related, usually kind of like heavier type of bands. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, cool stuff, though. Those are the books that came out this week. We will be right back after this short break. And we are back to talk about DC's brand new number one, City Boy, part of the Dawn of DC 
and the We Are Legends. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure what to call that. It's not an event. It's not. I'm it, not. A, I wasn't exactly sure what that was. Yeah, uh, it, it's just. Um, so DC Comics solicit reads as first seen in Wildstorm 30th anniversary special and Bob's favorite Lazarus Planet Legends Reborn. <laughs> As I saw that sigh there, that sigh. <laughs> There's a new Korean hero named City Boy, or at least that's the best translation of what the cities call him. City Boy, aka Cameron Kim, is just trying to make a living by using his powers of being able to speak to cities and find lost and hidden goods to pawn. It's just sorry, and it's only just enough to get by. And these abilities mean he means he hears everything everywhere all the time, including each city's histories and the truths behind them. It's very loud in his head and something he has to live with. As his powers get stronger, the cities start forming animal avatars from scraps in order to physically travel alongside him on his adventures. Of course, Gotham is a rat avatar made of city scraps, but what about Metropolis? Amnesty Bay, or even the Mascara. Not all cities are so kind. I find it very interesting that I read that solicit because, of course, not really any of that materializes here. We don't even see what his powers really are other than, like, kind of that x-ray vision. And I understand that the accident was created from a machine that's supposed to speak to cities or hear the city's consciousness or whatever it was. Right. But I didn't know that translated to his powers per se. So that's really interesting. It's really interesting that they go into the animal avatars too, because that wasn't even suggested yeah, here anywhere. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that was kind of a weird, you know, when I read the solicit myself, mm -hmm. that was, uh, that was kind of like, and then I read this issue, I'm just like, wait a minute, none of that really happened. I wonder if we're missing something by not having read the Wildstorm 30th anniversary special in the Lazarus Planet Legends Reborn. That's... If it's got Lazarus Planet in front of it, <laughs> I ain't reading it. Yeah, I uh, completely understood, I know. Uh, yeah, I haven't checked out either of those books either. And I know I knew that there was stories in here featuring the characters. So so yeah, maybe maybe it shows more of his power set, and then here in this book is more of his origin story, of course, and then his uh, adventures on his own. So so yeah, maybe that's where a lot of that comes from. I'm not too sure. Um, I I do want to read my solicit or sorry, my, my synopsis, <laughs> I, I don't really have a solicit, but my synopsis before I go into the creators of this book uh, city boy one opens with a mother leaving her young son with his grandpa in metropolis in a flashback city boy aka cameron kim is then shown in present day as he passes a beggar on the street and the beggar acknowledges that cameron is able to see things that no one else sees cameron finds some money and gives it to the beggar and then the boss and Bear with me here. I do not speak any Korean or any anything. I, I speak nothing other than English. I wish that I did. I wish I was that cultured. Do you speak English? I'm not yet. Yeah, barely. I barely speak English. Yeah, exactly. I can't even pronounce anything in English. So so please forgive me when I say these names or, or phrases. Uh, the Boss Chung, a.k.a. Moon Cut Boss, a.k.a. Cameron's... Well, give me this word again. Hyung. Hyung. Okay. Um, AKA big brother. <laughs> uh, he shows up expecting his 10% of the found money. And as he lets Cameron know that he shouldn't be out here by himself and he can protect him as long as he gets his cut. We then get a flashback to Cameron getting his powers as he enters a warehouse building and a scientist is demonstrating his new machine that will communicate with the consciousness of the city. Cameron gets in the way as a beam of energy goes through his eye. Cameron wakes up in present day screaming, City Boy goes out to find valuable trash and sell it to, uh, sorry, and sells it to get out of the city. He ends up at a resale shop. And just as he's paid, the boss shows up and Cameron tries to give him a cut, but he demands that Cameron work for him. 
a fight between Cameron and the boss lasts a few pages. And then we, out of nowhere, seemingly, we get ugly Manaheim, a.k.a. Bruno Manaheim, a.k.a. leader of inner gangs and his team that's been tracking an energy surge. Manaheim gets on his DC Apple Watch and uh, to let Darkseid know that he thinks he's found the kid. And Darkseid tells Bruno not to tell him what he thinks and to only tell him when City Boy is his. So that's kind of my little synopsis there. And again, there was a couple of words that I'm unsure about, so please forgive me. I'm not being insensitive. I'm just stupid. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> please forgive me for I'm that. I'm glad you specified. Well, I mean, I think that that part's already known, <laughs> but the stupid part uh, at the very least. So let's talk about Greg Pak for a second. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I think he's a newcomer to the game. This is probably his first published material. I haven't yeah, ever I've heard never of him. Heard from him. I've never heard of him before. <laughs> yeah, Greg Pak is actually, uh, of course, we're being facetious here, very, very huge. Um, it looks... Greg Pak is even somewhat of a, a director. He's got a few movies out, but of course, from comics. Let's just go down the list a little bit. I'm just gonna rattle some it's a off. Long list. Yeah, I'm just gonna rattle some. It won't be too many, but of course, he did uh, Warlock Volume Five back in '04. He's done a lot of X Men stuff. Did X Men Phoenix End Song One Through Five with Greg Land. So you got the two Gregs on that book. Did Phoenix War Song uh, One Through Five with Tyler Kirkham, one of Bob's favorites. Uh, did Magneto Testament 1 through 5 did Astonishing X-Men for a little bit Extreme X-Men he did Storm 1 through 11 back in 2014 Weapon X 1 through 27 with Greg Land X-Men Prime uh, Weapons of Mutant Destruction Alpha he did uh, the Iron Man House of M book uh, Marvel 1602 New World What If Submariner Amazing Fantasy 15, not that Amazing Fantasy 15, <laughs> but the one with <laughs> Man, Amadeus Cho. Yeah, I know. Look, uh, huge Hulk rider. Of course, we can get that out of the way very quickly. Did Incredible Hulk Volume 2, a lot of stuff on, on that. Did all of Totally Awesome Hulk with Frank Cho. Sorry, Frank Cho. Giant Size Hulk, Planet Hulk Gladiator, What If Planet Hulk, World War Hulk. World War Hulk after Smash Man. That's hard to say. That's like a tongue twister. <laughs> uh, did, did Scar, Son of Hulk. Of course, everybody's favorite from... Um, ah, damn. Now now I'm blanking on... Oh, he was in She-Hulk. That's right. <laughs> Everybody hated that character. But I liked him. He was fine. Uh, did Weapon H. Did Hulk Vereens. If you remember those books, man. Weapon H was, was such a wonderful book. Did a whole bunch of Hercules stuff. Won't go into all that. War Machine, Alpha Flight... Silver Surfer, Red Skull, Agents of Atlas. And then a couple of things over at DC. Did Batman vs. Superman, Action Comics, Secret Origins, Teen Titans. If you remember Met Cadet U uh, from Boom Studios, the one that's been optioned recently for a Netflix show, that was his. He also wrote on Firefly, Battlestar Galactica, Turok, Dinosaur Hunter, and John Wick. And one of my favorite things ever, he did Eternal Warrior 1-8 through eight over at Valiant Comics, so... Any Valiant writer is a friend of mine. So definitely, definitely somebody that you, even if you don't know who he is, you definitely know who he is. Um, you're you're familiar with tons and tons of his work there. Now, Bob, you're going to have to help me out again with this uh, illustrator's name. Minkyu Young is what I'm going with. Minkyu Young. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that as well. well. We'll settle on that and hope that we're right. Minkyu, if you're listening... Please forgive us if we're not right. I did want to reach out to Miku on Instagram, but it looks like there might be a little bit of a language barrier there. But hey, if there's not and you're listening, please, please come on the show. We'd love to talk to you about yes. this book or all of the other tons of books that you've done. The fact that we probably got your name wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, it probably won't happen. But <laughs> I look, let's talk about this guy because he's, he's done quite a bit. I'm going to start yes. with some of his DC work. He's done work on Batgirl. On Batman, Prelude to the Wedding, on Bob's favorite uh, series, Lazarus Planet, Legends Reborn. Done quite a few thing, uh, things on Nightwings, sorry, <laughs> on Nightwing as well as Titans. Let me not uh, pluralize Nightwing there. Justice League of America and Batgirl as well. And uh, very DC Halloween, if you remember that cool anthology book. Over at Marvel, he's just, he's done a lot. Um, I'm going to... 
Dr. Afra, Dr. Afra, Dr. Afra, Dr. Afra. Like, uh, he's done so much <laughs> at Star Wars, Dr. Afra. Which as... I, did, I did not realize until Dan actually did his research yes. and looked him up because I do not pay attention to names mm -hmm. when I'm reading a comic. Yep. I'm, I just pay attention to the comic. I love his work on Dr. Afra. Oh, yeah. Very, very good stuff there. He also had some credit in the curse of the man thing and in, in, in the trade of that series and then we're talking about all this dr afra he's done just as much for miss marvel <laughs> so really really cool artist someone you have seen before yes. definitely there's there's no way that you're you're missing this guy he's he's really good really good artist very looked very very young too i'm surprised to see so much credits with someone who looked like they were like barely out of their teens so uh, maybe he just looks great for his age. I don't know, but looked very, very young. So that's that's super cool. Bob, let's talk about this book. <laughs> uh, again, I so know I did it in reverse. That's what we do on this, on this podcast. Sometimes. Sometimes whenever it's worth it, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about the story beats. Um, this one, we talked about this before we hit record today. This is like such an interesting Silver Age origin story to me. It is. It's, you don't really see this in comics lately. In, in modern comics, this isn't the way they do it. It's usually a lot more convoluted than this. This is pretty straightforward. This, to me, seems like, and I have said this to Dan when we first started talking about it, this seems to me like the Psych Magnetron. <laughs> yeah, look, it has that feel. It has... Um, it's got the the Spider-Man Peter Parker field trip with his Fantastic uh, Four flying yeah, into a solar flare. I mean, it's just it's just got that Silver Age uh, origin mm -hmm. story to it. it. That's what this feels like, and I'm actually I, I welcome that. I think that's cool. I think that it's got to be hard to introduce a brand new character into one of the big two. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people do it, sure, but. They pop up in other books. They, whatever, um, of course, this character did as well. Popped up in two books before this. But I think to be able to introduce a character right now in, in the modern age and have them be for one of the big two and to come out swinging the way that Greg Pak did and, and just say, hey, this is a, a Silver Age origin story. That's what we're going to do here, and we're going to leave it on this crazy cliffhanger and everything. I think it was a ballsy move, and I think that it, it, it worked for, for the book. Mm -hmm. I think if this was like a more convoluted thing where we couldn't, we were just getting little bits and pieces of, of how the character came to be or whatever, I think that would take away from it. And I, I mean, to be honest with you, not that I have any problem with the character, I am invested in, in, and I like what I've read so far. I think that if it was done that way, I probably wouldn't be as invested to care what was going to come right, next. So right. I, I like the way this was done. But yeah, I, 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 I do like these simple origin stories. Yes. It's, it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, it really is. Something that uh, Greg Pak kind of does, you know, he, he's, he's, he doesn't make those crazy convoluted mm -hmm. origins and everything usually just kind of the character comes up and all right here's where they came from and here's where they are now and and i appreciate that level of writing definitely it's i i think sometimes it's it's probably harder to pull off that kind of thing and get it right i guess it is i mean it would be easy for any of us to write a very linear story of hey here's this person here's how they came to be and here's what they're doing now um, but to make that work, I think is a challenge. I think that would be very hard. So mm -hmm. I, I like the way this was done. I think the story beats work very well. We get from point A to point B and, we and we're there and it's, uh, again, it's left on a nice cliffhanger, a very good cliffhanger for somebody who's just coming into the book, for somebody who's unfamiliar, for somebody who maybe just picked this up off the stands because, or I say stands, like there's still new stands for comic books, but I was you know, going to say, where is there a new stand? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we're, look, we're in New York in the 1940s, Bob, pick up your comic off the rack. Okay? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Off the table, off the, I don't know, uh, what, whatever. Um, Gladly. <laughs> and then in today's day and age, it'll be worth a fortune. Yes. Ex well, yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the, the beats work here. I like the in reveal. I like all that it has has weight to it. Um, what about the narrative? How did you feel about 
the narrative of this book. I, I think that's probably one of the problems that I will have. I think that narration at the beginning kind of knocks it down a little bit for me. And then the narration throughout, I think that it could be told in a different way other than narrated. I think that it was a little tiny bit of a detriment, but I, it circles back to the Silver Age, so it works in context, but I, I'm just not sure about it. I think I think it was uh, uh, nicely done mm -hmm. the first time, but yeah. then when you circle back around and did this, and yeah, I mean, it was basically the same exact narration. That's where it was kind of like, okay, you don't exactly need this. Yeah, it, it seemed unneeded. It seemed like a, a little bit more, I mean, we could tell what was happening. I didn't mm. need all that at the beginning uh, and, and then throughout. I mean, I, I think maybe sometimes you can treat your readers with a little bit more, I, I don't know, hey, like get in, read this, figure it out, you know, type of thing. Let the art speak, whatever. Well, when they, when they did it at the beginning, I didn't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Because it was like, you know, him narrating, you know, um, narration is him as a young kid, you know, yep. um, you know, what the city means, all that kind of stuff. But they didn't need to do it again. After that, I just feel like they could have left it well enough alone and not mm -hmm. had that. I think it's going to be interesting moving on. Of, of course, we know that there's a lot more behind this character than just what we're seeing here. We're going to start seeing some animal avatars as the series goes and stuff right, like that. And as right. the character progresses. So, so there's going to be a lot there to the character and a lot more uh, to what's going on. I just, I wonder how that narration will, will continue. Uh, I, I'm it, not too sure. Cause to me, basically after this first issue, I mean, he's, you know, and I even said it, I mean, he's got Superman's x-ray vision. Yeah. And, you know, he can, in the immediate area, he can warp reality around him. And, and we're just seeing the immediate area. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm assuming eventually, you know, we're going to see that he can just do all kinds of crazy crap. But Yeah, sure. I it mean, it, it's, and granted, it's the first issue. So, I mean, we're not going to see everything in the first issue i mean that's just a trope that has been done in comics for god knows how long mm -hmm. yeah and i wonder how this will progress uh, of course maybe we should talk about this a little bit more in the world building but i i do wonder how those animal avatar powers will and, and really speaking to the city will kind of come to light because like you said right now it just seems more like he just sees through things uh, that's that's kind of what's presented here we know that that's different. That's supposed to be the city kind of communicating to him where this stuff is, what he's looking mm -hmm. for and all that. But but the way that it it's shown here right just now, seems that, like... Right now, that, I mean, that that just seemed like a... Uh, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want to say very small use of, mm -hmm. you know, um, his powers, but it just seemed like kind of a petty, superficial... Yep. you know, use of his powers mm -hmm. just to be able to see where things are. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, imagine being able to communicate with the consciousness of the city, what that does for you. And, and yeah, you're out here looking for... Looking for spare change yeah. and trinkets. Now, I mean, it. I guess it does make sense because he's got to realize his power. He's got to, you know, develop that in, in a certain way and everything. And of course we don't want to see him come out just swinging, you no. know, doing everything. It needs to progress. We need some time with the character, all of that. Sure. But yeah, I, I think that the narrative here, it, it definitely works. I think it leaves a little bit on the table. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a problem, but I do think that maybe it leaves a little bit more on the table than I'm, I don't know, comfortable with in this issue. So I, I think the, the narrative's a little janky for me, but how about the dialogue then? How do you feel about the voices of these characters, the voice of City Boy? Uh, you have any thoughts there? Um, actually, not, actually, not really. I mean, yeah. I, I think the voices fit the character. That's re Those are really my only thoughts. Nice yeah, I, I agree. I think that... Look, we can tell he's a little conflicted. It's not that he's an anti-hero or anything like that, but it's kind of like 
he's got these powers and he's he's like, look, I'm gonna use doesn't, what I have. Doesn't know exactly how to use. Yeah, it. doesn't know exactly that yet, and you can tell. I mean, there's a little bit of foreshadowing, of course. I mean, he's gonna be a hero. That's that's what the guy's gonna be. He's <laughs> he's Peter Parker until he figures out, you know, that he needs to fight crime and do good and all that. Right. Like, it, it'll happen, but. But I do like his voice. He's a little conflicted. He's a little – he's not going to cross over to the dark side and say, like, I don't care, old beggar guy. I'm not going to, like, find you any money or whatever. He finds some money and gives it to him and all of that. And, and Yeah, and, and, you know, we can definitely tell, you know, he cares about other people. Yep. Like, he, did, he didn't want to see the old beggar, you know, um, get his throat slit. Yep, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's something there, but he also has this this level of indifference that he's trying to I, I don't know um, portray or whatever. Like he wants people to think that he doesn't care, but you can tell that he does. You can tell that that it's it eats away at him, and he wants to do the right thing. He wants to help people, but at the same time, he's like I I kind of don't want to get involved. You know, right. I just I just want to get by day to day, and and that's it. Right. Um, so I think it is a cool nuance to the character. I like that about him. I think it really works in the context of this book, in the context of his powers and, and all of that. So then the world building, I think this is going to be kind of the biggest one here. This is a world building thing. This is this is Metropolis that we're seeing. Um, the, the, but the, this is definitely more the underbelly yeah it's the gritty kind of Metropolis, it's, it's, which we're not we, seeing superman we're not seeing any of that which i mean we've rarely ever seen yeah we're not seeing the daily planet in the background we're not seeing any of that we're seeing gritty streets and i mean gotham city of course mm -hmm. you know i think the entire city is the underbelly yeah exactly the underbelly yep but metropolis I don't remember ever reading about the underbelly of the yeah. strategies of Metropolis. Exactly. Yeah, we're see we're usually seeing you know Superman, Jimmy Olsen, uh, mm -hmm. Lois Lane, Lex Luthor, all those people, kind of in their big buildings and and whatever in the sky and all that. I think the closest to ground level we've gotten in a while was the number one that we reviewed a little while back, uh, and and even that doesn't have this level of uh, of of underbelly. So. I think that the world building really, really works here. I think that that is probably my favorite part of the book that I'm seeing so far. It, is, yeah, is, it, it, it makes Metropolis feel a little bit more real. Yeah, yeah. It. I mean, yeah, it, it basically builds an entire new world. Yeah, so, so now we know we have this Metropolis that's in Superman's world. We know that Metropolis very well. Now we're seeing like a whole other side of it. So now it's got a whole other dimension to it. And I think that that's really cool to take something like that and give it dimension, give it some character and and kind of look, there's people living here on the on the outskirts of, of Metropolis or whatever. There's there's whole communities uh, being brought up. You have this whole area where, you know, this boss guy comes around and expects a percentage of everything. You know, yeah. where is this guy when Superman's flying around? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, we know who Darkseid is. We don't. But but everybody else in this book, where's this crazy scientist? You know, whenever Superman's out doing his thing uh it, it's very interesting and it's very interesting that city boy would kind of be able to go skirt by all that kind of undetected or whatever for the most part of course he's not completely undetected because uh big people know who he is but but why is he not on superman's radar yet you know right, why why right. why that so so i don't know i i think that the world building is really cool here i really like that a lot and again it's it's really reminding me of those silver age origin stories which i really love so I think that this world building works very, very well. I think Greg Pak has done a wonderful job with with his side of this book. Let's get into the other creator side of this book. Let's get into the artwork. Bob, give me the name one more time, if, if you don't mind. Uh, Meek uh, you. Meek, Meek you Young. Meek you Young. Okay, okay, good. So let's get into some of his work. And of course, as we always try to say at the beginning of this thing, this is a team effort. This is not him solely. Right. Of course, he's illustrating his pencils and inks are probably in here. And then we have a colorist, a letterer, uh, all of those things. And, and those people deserve a lot of credit, too. Whenever we break down the creators, we do just generally go with the writer and the illustrator. So that's where we'll be here. But please don't take away from that that the other people don't matter because they absolutely matter a whole lot. We just don't have time to get into all of that sadly but 
uh, let's get into the characters here. How do you feel about uh, Cameron Kim and uh, the beggar and, and the crazy scientist and, and ugly and, and all those people? How do you feel about the, the, the characters here? Well, I mean, you, you can definitely tell by um, Cameron's design that he's, you know, a uh, Korean-American. Uh -huh. As you can tell by Boss Chung, yeah. that he's a Korean-American. And, I mean, they make, you know, the bigger looks like a bigger. And yep. So, and from, especially going back to, you know, Dr. Afra's design and mm -hmm. her um, comic book. She's, I mean, you know, she's even drawn, you know, um, kind of like, you know, she could have a little bit of, yep, mm -hmm. you know, um, Korean American in her. Yes, definitely. No, I'm sure she doesn't be in Star Wars. <laughs> well, I guess you never know. But yeah, yeah, I I agree. There's there's something there to her. Um, I I once I get into the characters here, I I kind of have a thought for you that I want to throw at you and, and mm -hmm. kind of get your your stance on it. Yes, Boss Chung looks like Loki. <laughs> yeah, he kind of does. <laughs> um, how do you feel about? Look, we have City Boy, we have Cameron Kim, aka City Boy here. And his character design is really just like he's a street level character. He's he's just kind of like a younger dude. He's got a hat on. He's got a jacket, you know, kind of jeans or whatever, tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. And at, at sometimes he's at some points he's wearing a face mask. But but that's it. Um, and by face mask, I mean, like what we're used to from the pandemic type of face mask, like a just a, a what, what do you call those besides face masks? It's got to have a name. Um, um. I don't know, but John Blank. Yeah, me too. I, it has some other kind of name, but I can't. Think I got. Of it. I got. I got to say on a side note though, mm -hmm. for a character called City Boy, uh -huh. they could not have picked a better design for his jacket. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the jacket's very cool. That's kind of what I wanted to get into. Uh, sorry, kind of what I wanted to get into though is usually when you think superhero or hero you think origin story you think all these things now of course we have like you know i was talking about spider-man before you think about daredevil you think about some of those characters that like they get their powers and it's not like you know all of a sudden a, a superman costume comes with it you kind of have to build to that you, right. you build to a costume or whatever but is this his design is this how we're always going to see him is he gonna have his you know superhero moment where you know, he gets a, a costume. He's going to be wearing, like, his bat suit. What, what are to we going to see from him? To be honest, I kind of hope how this is how he's drawn. Mm -hmm. Because that is that is something that I, I kind of want. I kind of would like a, a writer-artist team to get away from. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of like they wear normal clothes. And then in a few issues, they get a proper costume. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This, I think, is a perfect look, especially for a character called City Boy. Yeah, and I, I agree. He he just needs to kind of blend in with the city. Um, right. That's obviously not why that's his name. It's the character's name because he, you know, kind of communicates with the city and I mean, all of that. I mean, a, a character like, you know, Superman. Yep. You know, you, you want something that says, I am Superman. Yes. You know, I am powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, Batman. You want somebody who looks, you know, gritty, who looks like he could blend in with the shadows, yes, where you uh -huh. don't know where he's coming from. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you're right. He he blends in with the city. He blends in with the characters here. He's he, it, it works very well. I just I do wonder if that will change. I wonder I wonder what will happen. Uh, I think that'll be very very interesting. Again, I'm hoping his costume stays this way. Yeah, that I I agree. I think that would be a, a benefit to the character, a benefit to the book. What about the locations? We talked a little bit before about how this is kind of the the underbelly of Metropolis. This is a side of Metropolis we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. I I like the locations a lot, and it and it switches a lot. We're in the city. We're in the park. We're we're in the warehouse. We're at a pawn shop. Yeah, we kind of go all over the place. We we go through the city with the character. We right. we follow him through the city. He's not. You know, stuck in a location. I uh, again, I, I hate to keep saying Silver Age Spider Man, but that's the vibe I'm getting. You know, that's that's really where a lot of this is coming from for me. 
Spider-Man in the park, Spider-Man walking in the streets of New York, whatever. Like I'm seeing a lot of that Spider-Man going to a warehouse or like the, you know, probably, school or whatever. Um, probably the most, you know, Metropolis proper thing we get mm -hmm. is when the beggar is sitting in front of that high rise hotel. Yep. Yeah, we do. Excuse me. We do get a, a little glimpse of a high rise there. We do get that part of, of the Metropolis city. Yeah, I think these locations work great. I, I really mm -hmm. like them a lot. If you were to tell me that this was just any city, you know, it, it would work. I love that it's Metropolis, though. I think that that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really like that. What about the backgrounds? You have any thoughts on these backgrounds? Now, you've got it open to that first page there. Right. We've got that first panel. The big city here in Metropolis. Uh, all the big high-rise buildings in the back. Um, they look great. The The backgrounds look really good. They're very as, fleshed and, out. And as I'm now saying, you do see the Daily Planet. Oh, okay, so once. we do get, we do get one appearance of the Daily Planet yes. right there in the very first panel, which yes. is cool. And, I mean, you've got to... Of course, we know what the Daily Planet is. I, I think most people do. But if you're just somebody picking up a comic book for the first time, you might not know that's the Daily Planet. You don't get the letters or anything on the building. It's just that we know what it looks like, of course. But uh, I I like these backgrounds. I think the the level of detail in, in the backgrounds, yeah. like, like you and I both say that yeah. we always like they're fleshed out. There's no blobs there. There's no right. empty space. Like it, it's done very well. There's cracks in the, in the sidewalks and, and everything. Right. I mean, you know, granted this is Metropolis mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sure somebody would, you know, work in the Daily Planet anyway, but you can definitely tell that's the Daily Planet. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, that's supposed to be the Daily Planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, these backgrounds work great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm just looking at this first panel here where we've got the cityscape, we've got the the mother dropping off city boy there with his grandfather and everything, and there is a a, a nice level of detail mm -hmm. there in the background. We've got a nice tree, great shading on it. We've got the the mom's suitcase and everything. We've got city boy with his oversized kind of hoodie with just so much detail and and everything. Yeah, I think these. Uh, of course, the hoodie not being part of the background, but, but still, uh, the backgrounds are, are really working great here. They're working to a benefit of the book, and they just they have that city feel. Right. You feel real and gritty here in the city. So I, I think that, yeah, that's a that's a big plus. When you, I mean, when you when you see the bigger in the background, you can see the, um, you know, diners at the hotel yep. restaurant. You mm -hmm. can make them out. Yeah, they're shown there through the window, and it, it looks great. It's from a window it looks it looks like a window very very good artwork uh, as city boy is passing through the streets there a lot of good detail on the shops off to the side off to the uh, apartments or whatever is over there there's just a, a good amount of detail here in this book so yes I like that let's talk about the colors then and of course we do have a separate colorist by the name of Sonny I'm not even going to try to pronounce that last name, Bob, but it's G-H-O. So. I'm going to say go. Okay, so Sonny Go uh, is what I'm, I'm going to go with. I'm going to okay. say go. All right, well, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, of course, separate colorists here on this book. Um, colors really work for me. They mm -hmm. are – I here's what I'm going to say about the colors and, mm -hmm. and the whole tone of the book based on the colors. Mm -hmm. It would be very, very easy to take Metropolis and – say we want the gritty underbelly here of metropolis let's darken it up let's make it more like gotham but say it's metropolis and, and it works because we've said it's metropolis but it's the underbelly whatever i think that that would be easy to do but that's not the direction they want at all no. this looks like metropolis even though it's in the underbelly even though it's the part that we, we don't normally see or whatever it's the streets it's this it's, it's not the normal superman thing this looks like Metropolis. Uh, it's It's got the tones of Metropolis to it. The colors pop in a certain way, and it doesn't have all of that grayscale to it to make it like a Gotham or anything. No, but I think what makes it work is mostly the colors are, you know, darker. Yes. Uh -huh. So, I mean, while... You know, the colors of the panels themselves don't have that, you know, sepia tone, grayscale. Yep. 
the fact that they use you know darker colors throughout the book mm -hmm. you know does the job so while you can tell it's still you know the vibrant metropolis yep it's not metropolis proper just because they use all the dark colors yeah it really works it's a good kind of contrast mm -hmm. in there it, it's, it it's cool uh, i'm looking at city boy's design where he's got the black hat with the blue rim he's got the kind of darker red jacket and everything and it would be easy to make those colors similar to superman but they're not they're completely different we've got the the red and blue but they're a whole different world of right. red and blue right. that work for the character that that don't go into the superman right. of it all they so. are darker grittier you know um mm -hmm. red and blue yep yeah so i think it, it works pretty well bob let's go into the the question of the night are you does this intrigue you enough does this pique your interest enough to move on to issue number two um how do you feel um, even, even before that cliffhanger ending, cause I'm interested to see, you know, what, <laughs> yeah. what you know, it, what's his role going to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to pick this up just because I'm curious as to, okay, what's his full power set going to lead to? Yep. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's my, that's my curiosity. It's kind of like, I, we're just scratching the surface of his powers. Uh -huh. What else? you know, or her power is going to be able to do. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, it, it's, it's a win for me. I, I also want to continue on to issue number two, but it, I, I'm, I really, really liking the, the silver age style origin story mm -hmm. of it all. And I think that Greg Pak is, is obviously smart enough and a good enough writer to build that out in a, in a way that has just, just level of anticipation where he's not going to throw it all out right off the bat he's going to let this character build a little organically or whatever i yeah i agree i think this is a win i definitely want to know what's going to happen next i'm mm -hmm. very interested in that so so yeah this is a, a win all around um uh, uh, i mean there's not really anything negative i can say about the book i i i didn't love the um uh, kind of narrative style at first it took me a minute to get past that um, other than that, everything worked very well. The beats, the dialogue, the world building, especially the character locations, background and colors. Um, yeah, I definitely want to see what's going to happen in issue number two. And, and like you said, that cliffhanger, I mean, what's, what's going to happen? What does dark side want him for? I mean, we know what dark side wants him for, but how's, what's going to happen here? Can city boy fight off dark side himself? Do you think that he's got the power to do that? Is he going to have to pull in somebody like Superman or <laughs> like what's, what's going to happen here and the, the possibilities of what can happen are, are really cool. So I will say for 100% certainty, since this takes place in Metropolis, yeah. there is no way <laughs> at least one of these issues, yeah. who knows how far down the road that they will not use Superman. Yeah, I, I agree, but I, I'm down with that. I, I'd honestly kind of like to see a team up of City Boy and Superman for an issue or something. Now, hopefully he doesn't turn into Superman sidekick or anything. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like this. I, I think it was cool. And I'll definitely move on to issue number two as well. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some issues that are dropping next week in comic book shops. <laughs> Bob, we are back with the all new, all different number one comics podcast to talk about some books that are dropping next week in local comic book shops. Bob, what do you got for us? And again, as I always say on every episode, disclaimer books, time. Yes, these books are subject to change. And again, this is off of Key Collectors, so this is not every issue coming out next week. So. Sure. If I do not say an issue, I apologize. That's right. If Bob forgets to say your comic book that's coming out next week, yes. then send us an email, send us a message on Instagram. Snail mail. Yeah, whatever. Uh, tell us to cover your comic book and come on the show and talk about it, damn it. Yes. <laughs> uh, from Marvel Comics, we have Amazing Spider-Man number 26. Bob, I heard that this is going to be a big issue. Um, we're not going to spoil anything here because we did a spoiler alert on the last show to kind of talk about what could be happening there. But 
But yeah, this, um, look, all I'm going to say is you might want to pick up a copy. Yes, and that is a very vague solicit. That's spoiling <laughs> without spoiling. Sure, just just pick up a copy, you know? I mean, yes. what's the worst that could happen? You don't like it? And the best that could happen is it could increase in value really quickly. <laughs> sure, yeah, never know. Uh, also from Marvel, we have Edge of Spider-Verse number two. That's got a first appearance of Sky Spider, the guardian of a secluded village, and the first cameo appearance of a newly born spider baby. Aww. Well, that becomes popular as Grogu. <laughs> well, I mean, who doesn't love a spider baby? This is a, uh, the parents. Yeah, well, that's probably true. <laughs> From DC, we have DC Pride. 2023 number one yeah so dc usually dc and marvel put out uh, pride books a, a lot of times anthology books each year kind of celebrating diversity and pride and, and all of that and and yeah this is the newest dc pride book that comes out this week so check that out probably have a little bit higher of a cover price usually close to like 9.99 i think is what they normally are but right. if you're prepared to pay 10 bucks then that's the book for you Mm. From DC, we have New Talent Showcase, The Milestone Initiative Number 1. An anthology of 12 stories by 12 writers and artists new to the comic industry who worked with DC to hone their craft in the Alley sponsored Milestone Initiative. I don't know what Alley sponsored is, but sure. So we've got brand new comic book writers and artists jumping over to DC to do an initiative that's pretty damn cool yes from going back to marvel we have carnage number 13. cart cart part of the <laughs> carnage reigns storyline part three of Words that uh, story. for me yeah you're that's an understatement uh, good thing that i chose to do a podcast where i have to talk the whole time <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> So everybody looking, I know a lot of people are looking forward to this video game, and DC is having a prequel tie-in to the Suicide Squad Kill Arkham Asylum number one. Yeah, a prequel to the video game Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. So, yeah, very cool. Which hopefully will be coming out because it's been delayed multiple times. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, pick this up. Why not? Uh, of course, the Spider-Man game book is, is doing well. Maybe this will do well. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. And uh, from DC, we have the Power Girl special number one. Always probably not a bad idea to jump on a Power Girl thing. Um, of course, some of those covers are pretty sought after. So this one's got a few variant covers as well that are probably going to be a little sought after. So... Yeah, might want to jump on the Power Girl train there, pick up a book. Who knows what could happen in the world of comics is all I'm saying. Bob, we're going to spin the randomizer really quick and see what book we're covering next week. I will say that it is between um, a book called Star Storm, uh, which might have a longer title than that, but I'm going to have to kill a little bit of time for a second and look it might not just be star storm might have yes it is called savage strength of star storm number one there's also a book called cat fight and north valley grimoire 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 i don't know <laughs> that, that, that's as that's as good as i can come yeah up with. uh look we'll We'll not waste any time talking about these books. Let's let's spin the wheel and, and see what happens. Um, Bob, is there one that you're pulling for? Let's uh, let's see. Actually, <laughs> actually, cat fight sounded interesting to me. Well, you got lucky because it is cat fight. Okay. So okay. looks like we'll be covering cat fight issue number one next week, and that is published from IDW. Okay. Uh, I will. You know, normally we don't do this, but why not? I'm gonna read the solicit just really quick, just for anybody who might be deciding if they're gonna tune in next week or not. Uh, this is written by Andrew Wheeler, and the solicit reads that it's John Wick meets. Kill Bill meets cats. 
Felix saves, <laughs> wow, sorry. <clears throat> Felix lives a life of high fashion and indulgence, sure. He steals to get it, but he gets it on his own, nonetheless. When a mysterious character by the name of Trudinger, well, that's probably not the name, threatens the life, or sorry, <laughs> wow, threatens Felix's only surviving family member in an attempt to recruit him into a crime syndicate. Felix is sent on a globe-trotting game of cat and mouse in a heightened world of criminal, colorful criminal masterminds. And I and ju just to, just yeah. to correct yeah, you, yeah, please, please do. It's Schrodinger. Schrodinger. What did I say? I have no idea, yeah, but it was I, not Schrodinger. Just <laughs> random mashup of sounds. Schrodinger <laughs> shine. Um, yeah, that sounds like me. But uh, yeah, that's the book we're going to be covering next week. If you guys want to tune in and check that out, Bob and I would greatly appreciate it. We Bob would. needs a new pair of shoes, so <laughs> please check us out. Um, and, and with that being said, uh, check us out on social. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I should give up talking for the night. Check us out on social media. We are at Instagram at a N a D underscore number one comics podcast on Twitter, which hopefully will blow up and not be around much longer, but we are on Twitter at a N a D N O comic pod. We are on TikTok at a N a D number one comics pod. And on YouTube under the comic book channel. Of course, this and every week, all you got to do is use our hashtag all new, all different nation in a post on a social media platform of your choice to be entered in our giveaway where this week we'll be giving away DC Comics City Boy issue number one. Bob, that's all I got for us. This may be podcast next week. Who knows? <laughs> it will be. Don't you worry. We'll be here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.